The Old Testament reading, Isaiah 29, 11 through 19. And the vision of all this has become to you like one, like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, Read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, Read this, he says, I cannot read. And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me. And their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder. And the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. And you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, Who sees us? Who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay, that the maker may, that the thing made should say of its maker, He did not make me? Or the thing formed say of him who formed it, He has no understanding? It is not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest. In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children. Oh, I'm sorry. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable things, and there is none who does good. The Lord, the Lord looks, looks down, down from heaven, from heaven on, on the children, the children of, man, of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek yeah. after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have been, become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they have no they knowledge, knowledge, all the evildoers who eat, who eat up my people as they, as they eat, eat bread, bread and do, do not, not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame, shame the plans, plans of the poor, but, but the, the Lord is his refuge. refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. The epistle lesson is from Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the Church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, to whom shall we go? You 
Sunday after Pentecost is found according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. When the Pharisees gathered to Jesus with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? but eat with defiled hands. And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles his father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother, Whatever you would have gained from me is korban, that is given to God. Then you, do, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making, the, making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace 
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. And let us pray. Lord, today as we open up the Word and delve into it, we pray for the gift of the Spirit, that the Spirit would help us to understand this very important part of Scripture and interpret it correctly so that we might defend it when it is denied and spoken against, but most importantly, that we might live according to it so that our individual lives, our families, and our church might be wonderfully blessed and strengthened. So speak to us and may we receive your word gladly. Amen. I'm going to speak today on the epistle lesson, which is found in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, 22 to 33. It seems today, as we look around, and if you have the courage to watch the news some nights, um, that everything is falling apart. Families seem to be falling apart. Marriages seem to be falling apart. And I think that we live in one of the most acrimonious political atmospheres that we've ever seen in the United States of America. Maybe it was its parallel to the time of the Civil War, but it is not a good situation out there in many respects in our society today. Like I said, it seems like things are unraveling really, really quickly and falling apart. So we need a solution to this, and it comes from the Lord, if we will only open ourselves up to him and receive his word. What the world needs today is love, sweet love. It's not the kind of love that the secularists would have us to embrace, which is kind of a hormonal, saccharine, sweet kind of love. It's not that kind of love. It's the kind of love that our Lord Jesus Christ spoke about and lived throughout his life all the way up to his death. It's the kind of love that the um, apostles lived and spoke about and wrote about in the Holy Word of God. So I would like to have you consider today that God's love is kind of like a super glue. If we apply that love to an unraveling society, it will mend it back together. First of all, I'd like you to consider that God's super glue kind of love consists of loving submission to everyone, especially our brethren in Christ. And it's unfortunate that those who put together the lectionary did not include some verses before this section because it really helps put things into context. So I'm going to read to you verses 20 through 21. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So what the Apostle Paul is talking about here is a spirit-filled life. Someone who has a spirit-filled life is filled with the Spirit, is walking in the Spirit, is empowered by the Spirit. And so that person is going to be able to accept the hard sayings of the Lord. And I think that Ephesians chapter 5 here is a hard saying of the Lord. A lot of people look upon it very superficially and they cannot receive it. Um, Those who are secularists today say that's what's wrong with Christianity. It's patriarchal, it's misogynistic, it's anti-woman and sexist. But that's definitely not where the Apostle Paul was going. If you look at church history, the history of the world, Christianity really lifted, elevated the position of the woman in the first century in the Roman Empire radically 
um, and to call his words here um, what I just described is a total misunderstanding of what he had to say. So I'm trying to today um, help you understand exactly what Paul was saying and put it into the proper context. So a person who is walking in the Spirit and living in the Spirit um, submits himself first and foremost to God and what God's will is for his life. So that's the kind of person that Paul is talking to. Someone whose heart has been softened by the word of God, the gospel, and the Holy Spirit. And so they've submitted themselves to God. And when you submit yourself to God, you receive the same heart that God has. And when you submit yourself to God, you submit yourselves to other people. And what it means to submit... I would propose to you here today is to not put yourself in uh, number one place. Not to say I'm numero uno, but to think of other people first and to serve them and to serve their needs rather than your needs. And this is exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ did when he came to this earth. He could have stayed in heaven and enjoyed all the wonders and all the glories of heaven. But he came to be our servant, even though he was God. And he came and lived a life of service, always thinking of other people before himself and putting them in front of his own needs, all the way to the cross, where he became the victim and the sacrifice for our sins, so that we would be reconciled um, to God and so that the whole human race would be salvaged. This submitting ourselves to one another is a radical kind of Christianity. It's the kind of lifestyle that totally turned the first century Roman world on its head and uh, caused unbelievers to even say um, that um, the church was really making a dent and a difference in their world in that day. So first of all, the superglue kind of love is that love that submits itself to others and serves them rather than just thinking about oneself. And then secondarily, God's love is and involves a loving submission of wife to husband. And this is kind of where people in our culture today have a huge problem. But let me try to explain to you what Paul was saying here. Um, Christian wives will want to submit themselves to their husbands. Feminists don't like these words, but they don't understand these words. And if you really want to understand these words, you have to go back into the ancient Greek. Because the Greek carries the nuances that even the best English translations do not convey. And so I mustered up all of my Greek grammar skills and vocable skills that I learned in college and seminary and spent some extra time um, looking things up and trying to figure out what Paul was saying this past year, uh, this past week. So, I think it's kind of interesting. Remember, I just read verse 21 to you. And in verse 21, it said that we are to be submitting ourselves to one another. And just uh, if there's anybody here that uh, is interested in grammar and um, all those kinds of good stuff, um, this is a participle. It's a present passive participle. So it means submitting yourself continually to each other. It's kind of a lifestyle sort of thing. It's not something that you do just once, but it's a continual thing that you do. And then in verse 22, I thought it was really interesting, the, Greek, or the English translations insert a verb there, but actually there's no verb in, um, in verse 22. 
So I think basically if you really want to understand verse 21 and 22, you merge them together into one sentence. And so this is how it goes. This is the Kurt Lupkeman translation of Ephesians 5, 21 and 22. Submitting to one another in fear, that's actually what the Greek says, uh, in ESV it's reverence, so I'll say it again. Submitting to one another in reverence of Christ, wives to their own men as unto the Lord. So we're already talking to spirit-filled people. People who are already submitted to the Lord and submitting themselves to other people, which, as we said before, is putting other people's needs before our own and thinking about how we might help them out and thinking beyond our nose. Um, and this is a lifestyle. And shouldn't this doubly be the case for a Christian woman who's thinking about the most important person in her life? And the most important person for a Christian wife is probably her husband. You're around that person a lot. You're living in the same space. Um, you're bumping into each other and you're conversing and making uh, important decisions with one another. And so what Paul is saying is uh, practice that um, servant love towards your husband. Don't just think about your own needs first. Think about his needs also. And he goes on to say that a wife, a Christian wife, submits to his her husband as the church submits to Christ. And so when she is submitting to her husband, she is actually submitting to Jesus Christ who lives inside of her husband. It's a very easy thing to do. It's not something that a Christian husband has to force her, his wife to do. It just flows as one of the fruits of the Spirit. So we're submitting to one another, that is to everyone around us, thinking of their needs. A wife is submitting to her husband, thinking of his needs and um, not just thinking of her own needs and being selfish. And then thirdly, and we have to have this in the context or you really don't understand what Paul is saying. And this often is what people do. They stop and they just simply pick verses out of the blue and don't take them in the context and you simply can't understand what the scripture is saying. Then we go on to the husband. We see a super glue kind of love in the husband as he shows sacri sacrificial love to his wife. And so I'm going to read Paul's words to you again here. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with a word, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. So the husband has Christ living in him. He loves Jesus Christ. Um, he loves the word of Jesus Christ. He wants to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ loves his bride, the church, and loved the church so much that he laid down his life for the church and became the victim and suffered the pangs of hell for the church. And the husband, who's really a Christian, has that same sort of love that Jesus does and is willing to not only be tender and merciful and loving towards his life, but when the rubber meets the road, he is willing to lay down his life for his wife, to give it all up so that she might be blessed, so that she might be protected, so that she might continue to have a healthy and loving and joyous life. And this is what Paul is talking about. 
There's no sexism here. There's no misogyny. There's no patriarchy. There's no victimhood here uh, when we really understand what God's word is talking about. It is truly love, sweet love. And so when it's practiced in the family, between husband and wife, it's taught to the children, and the children know what loving relationships are all about, and when they grow up, they can live their lives that way. But the Christian family unit can become a powerful force for good and for change and for bringing things back together and making them whole again and lovely again in a world that's falling apart because people are really not understanding or listening or conforming to the word of God. May we hear the word of God. May we believe it. May we try with the help of the Holy Spirit to apply that word to our lives. And we will see the super glue of God's love not only restoring us, but everyone around us. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Church, we confess our faith today in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in the house of God, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into Thank you.